preach from. We want to continue on in our subject um, in Revelation, and this week we're going to be looking at the church of Thyatira. So pray with me as we uh, open up God's word and talk together with God. Here we are, Father. We thank you. We love you, and we give ourselves to you. And we ask, um, it's hard, it's hard sometimes, God, um, in the world we live, it's hard sometimes to figure out which way to go. And especially, Father, as much as has changed in our world from when we were small, and so today, Father, we ask that you would teach us a lesson from Revelation in this church and the difficulty that they faced. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Nearly one in three Americans uh, have fallen victim to a phone scam at some point um, in, the pa- in the past year. Like uh, the ones where someone calls pretending to be from the IRS or from a company inquiring about an expiring warranty on your vehicle. How many of you get those? Right. Uh, and it's interesting, um, you would think that it would, have been, it, it's, it would have gotten harder, but it's actually gotten easier. Uh, according to a, a, a new report from a, a, a company called Truecaller, it finds that roughly 54, 59, 59 million Americans have lost some amount of money to phone scams over the past year. And about 19% fell victim more than once, according to the report. Um, fraudsters are very good at what they do. They understand all the technology, they, all, all the loopholes and all the gaps to get into the networks, as well as all the psychological approaches and intimidation tactics that people succumb to getting them to pay. Now, just so that you understand, uh, what's interesting about this is, is that True Color has found that younger Americans are more susceptible to phone scams than older people. About 59% of men report being scammed as compared to just 38% of women. Americans in general, uh, it's not just phone scams, uh, Americans in general lost $68 million last year to job scams. Um, fake Fake postings for jobs, work from home scams, Job seekers should also be wary of job postings for nannies, caregivers, virtual personal assistants, especially if a stranger reaches out to you. The FTC warns that many of these fronts are fakes and uh, are a fake check scam, actually. In this scenario, the scammer will send you a check, have you deposit it, and then ask you to return some or all of the money uh, that you have deposited because you have to cover startup equipment, or they've accidentally overpaid you. And then banks are required by law to make deposit funds available to you as quickly as they can, usually within two days. And what the scammers hope is that you'll send them the money uh, in a hard way to trace, like through a wire transfer or a gift card, before the bank can alert you that their check has bounced. So they get you to deposit their check and then they call you back almost immediately and tell you that you need to refund them. And so you end up refunding them from your account. Meanwhile, the check they sent you is bogus. And so wh- why am I saying all that? Because seduction and, and getting duped is very much a part of life. And it always has been. And the church that we're going to be looking at today fall, fell prey to something like this. It's the church in Thyatira. So the the title for today's sermon is Oh, it's not back here. That that's not on back there. I if I if I could get that one turned on that would be good. Yeah, the title for today's sermon is called Seducing the Saints. And just to just to to help you once again cover some of the bases, we can go to the next slide. We're, we, once again, we started out down at Patmos down here, and then we made our way up through these three churches, and now we're heading south. And today we're going to be talking about the town of, Thi- the city of Thyatira. And actually, the, the reason why this city was, was built 
and you can go to the next slide. The reason why this city was built was actually as a, as a, a garrison for Pergamon. Pergamon was a very wealthy city, had a lot of uh, well-to-do uh, people, government officials, a lot of money in it. And so they built the city of Thyatira as a buffer. And in case uh, a, a marauding group was coming from the east, they would, they would have to encounter Thyatira first. And there were a lot of uh, soldiers, um, tradesmen, uh, more what we would call blue-collar people who lived in the city of Thyatira. And so Jesus, we'll see today, says this to these people. I have seen your love, your faith, your servants, your service, and your patient endurance. And you would look and say, my goodness, if this was us as a church, we'd go, this, we'd be doing cartwheels. But Jesus has something very different to say in addition to this. So let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. You can follow up here if you would like. Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to, 19, 18 to 29. This is the longest letter in, in the letters to the seven churches uh, that Jesus, uh, the Spirit of, of God, sends out. So here's what it begins to say. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. He goes on to say, I know all the things you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all of these things. And, and actually one of the other translations says, from the beginning until now. But, Jesus says, I have this complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat foods offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds." I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and the intentions of every person. And I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teacher, this false teaching, deeper truths as they call them. Depths of Satan, actually. I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. To all who are victorious and who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I received from my Father, and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Getting a very clear picture of Jesus can be difficult for us. Um, this is what uh, it says in Revelation chapter 2 at the very beginning of this. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God whose eyes are like flames of fire whose feet are like polished bronze. And this harkens back to what began very early on in the book of Revelation. If you want to turn there, you can. Otherwise, I'm just going to simply read it to you. It's Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. And so this is what John begins to say in, in chapter 1. I, when I turn to see who was speaking to me, now, start to get this picture. If you need to, close your eyes and picture it in your mind. I saw seven gold lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. 
His feet were like polished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. Not too out of the way or out of the norm so far, but here it goes. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. His face was like the sun in all of its brilliance. That picture of Jesus is not the standard picture that we look at when we put a picture up on the wall. How many of you have ever seen a picture like this up on a wall with Jesus with a sword coming out of his mouth on a regular basis? I've never seen one up on a wall in a church. But, but I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is <laughs> sometimes it's hard for us to get a clear picture of who Jesus is and what he looks like. But John says, this is who I saw. I, I saw this man wh- whose hair was so white. It, it was white like snow. And he's holding seven stars in his hand. His feet are like polished bronze. And, and out of his mouth, once again, is coming the sword. I remember the very first time that I, that I did some serious backpacking when I was in my late 20s. I had, I had grown up in, in Texas, and I'd forgotten, because on the ranch where I lived, there wasn't a whole lot of city light. But I had not paid a whole lot of attention to the evening sky when I was a ch- when I was a teenager, and when I moved to Chicago, the light pollution is so bad you can't see anything. You can't even see. You can barely see the moon on a, on a dark night for all the light pollution that's in Chicago. So I moved to the Northwest and I went backpacking with some friends of mine in early August, and we went up and we got up to about eight thousand feet. And we camped it somewhere close to that, that elevation. And I remember the first night when it, when it got dark, and they're all sitting around the campfire, and I, and I kind of laid back and, and started looking, and there were, a lot of, there were a whole lot more stars than I'd ever remember seeing in my life. And if you watched long enough and, and lie down in one spot long enough, I'm not kidding you, you could see satellites whizzing across the sky. And if you waited long enough, they would come back around and you would see them again. That's how fast they travel. But, but, but I, I had never seen stars like that. Astronomers who, who look at the night sky and who take ph- photography, what they call astrophotography, they, they salivate for skies like that because there aren't a whole lot of places... East of the Mississippi River, if you look on a light pollution map on your, on your phone or on your, on, on your tablet or on your computer, you will see that from east of the Mississippi all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, there are very few dark spots left in the United States. Now, if you go west of the Mississippi, you'll find areas in Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico. And some places fear, still far up north towards the, uh, towards the Canadian border. And especially in Canada, it's dark. And you, you can see things that you have never, ever seen before when there is no light pollution. And I'm, and I'm saying to you that, that sometimes I think our, in our relationship with Jesus, that's kind of what happens to us. The pollution of life, living life, the relationships that we have to manage, and the people we have to work with, and the responsibilities that we have, they can crowd out Seriously, they can crowd out a clear picture of who Jesus is and, and what Jesus wants to communicate. Because it's not just Jesus' voice that impacts our life. It's actually Jesus himself, his form, who he is. It's all about Jesus. It's his voice. It's his physical form. It's, it's the words that he speaks to us and the, and, and the meaning behind them. There are, there are so much, and there is so much about Jesus that we have to continue to, go, to learn and grasp a hold of. We never get to the end of understanding who Jesus is. Never in our life. You may have walked with Jesus for 70 plus, 90, maybe 80 years. And you can still sit down 
and Jesus can reveal something to you and you'll go, I have never, ever seen that before. And the trouble is, is life can make it so that it gets so commonplace and so boring that you and I lose that sense of wonder and awe about Jesus because we go, it's just Jesus. And Jesus is trying to make sure in this, in this book of Revelation that these churches get a clear picture of who he is. So let's, let's start by doing this. Let's look at verse 19. Jesus says this to them, I know all the things that you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. I can see your constant improvement in all of these things. A Christian's life who is, that is defined by these things, we would call this person more than likely a godly person. For instance, if as a Christian you value loving others and it's a priority to you, that means you're giving yourself, you're surrendering yourself, you are, you are, you are actually sharing part of who you are with others on a regular basis. And that is part of self-sacrifice. Because one of the hardest parts about being a Christian is when God looks at you and says, I need you to give yourself to this person. And you and I look at them and say, I don't like them. I don't like you. And God looks at us and says, I didn't ask you whether you like them or not. I've asked you to serve them and to love them. Well, Lord, they're not my favorite person. Once again, God would say, I didn't ask you if they were your favorite person. I'm asking you to give yourself and love them. And if you actually do that, God, we, we know that God smiles on that kind of behavior. So if this is one of the things that marks your life as a Christian, you would check that off and go, I'm learning and I'm growing and I'm sure God is pleased with me. But that's not all that's on the list. Faith. Faith is a life of active obedience before God, even when you don't see what the outcome is going to be. That's, Romans cha- that's Hebrews chapter 11, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that you cannot see. In our world, if you say to someone, if someone says to you, give me some evidence, show me proof of why you believe this, and you, you show them an empty hand that says, I have nothing physically to show you, the only proof I can tell you is that I know deep inside of me that it's right, they look at you and say, that's no proof at all. But that's the definition of faith in the Bible, the evidence of things that you cannot see. So if you have love and you have faith in your life, we're going, oh, so far, pretty good. Now let's not only add that, let's add the whole issue of, once again, of serving people, of giving yourself. The scriptures talk about the idea that we were called to be servants. First of all, a servant to Jesus Christ. We do his bidding without question. Sometimes that's hard, but really in reality, what God wants from us is when God says, go and do this, we simply say, I'm on my way. And if God says, jump off a cliff, we say, how far do you want me to jump out? And if God says, climb the wall, we say, how high do you want me to go? When it comes to serving God, we would run through a brick wall. And then God looks at us and says, Are you willing to do that for the people that I've called you to serve? To not be the one who's in charge, but to be the one who says, what can I do for you today? How can I help you? What can I do to help you grow and walk with God? That's that's the definition of being a servant. You have no rights. The only right you have is to do what the master asks you to do. So if you have love, if you have faith, and if service is a part of your life, you're going, well, Surely this person must be very godly. And then on top of that, I had patience and endurance. I, I like to define patience as having an unending humility and endurance. Patience is eternity and time. Because when does patience ever run out? According to the Bible, when does our patience ever come to an end? There is no end to our patience. God looks at us and says, I, this person that I've asked you to serve, by the way, this asks you to love and serve and give yourself for, and you look at him and you, say, you look at God and you say, well, how long do I have to do it? And God says, there's no end to this. And you say, but God, I, I don't know that I have the patience 
to love this person. And God says, I know, but I'm not giving you any way to get out of it. Patience is one of those kind of things that we go, it's for the long haul. How many of you have ever run long distances before? I can't do it. I'm a sprinter. I I don't understand people who run long distances. I had a friend in high school whose name was Jack. And Jack was one of these kind of guys that he started, as he would start running, um, at about halfway through, somehow he would find his second wind and it became no effort for him to run. He could run and run. It's, It's like... It's like Forrest Gump all over again. I'm serious. My friend Jack could run like that. And, and that's the kind of idea what patience is. Really. There is no end to this journey when it comes to patience and extending it to people. And then endurance. The endurance that comes along with patience is needed because how many of you, I get tired. How many of you woke up sometime this week and said, I could go back to sleep? Yeah. I, you go to bed and you think, I'm going to get a good night's rest. I'm going to wake up refreshed. And you wake up in the morning and you go, I'm as tired right now as I was when I went to bed. And, and sometimes endurance is hard to come by. <coughs> but God says, I need you to be into this for the long haul. So if we want to use these words, love, faith, service, patience, and endurance, we'd go, this person's living a pretty godly life, and God ought to be extremely pleased with this kind of person. And then still, there's something more here. Look at verses 20 to 23 in Revelation chapter 2. Despite all these description of this church, Jesus says this, I have a complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, and we don't know who she was. The scripture calls her that Jezebel, but we do not know what her name was. That Jezebel who calls herself a prophet, and a prophet is defined as someone who speaks for God. She calls herself a prophet, but she has led many of my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat fruit, food offered to idols. This was commonplace in the, in the early part of the first century where meat was brought, sacrificed to idols in, in pagan temples, and then they would take the animals after they killed them, and then they would butcher them, and then the food would be distributed among people. Either they would buy it, or it might be handed out. But, but the struggle for the early church was, do we eat this kind of food? Because it's been offered to pagan idols. Do we eat this food, or, or, or do we not partake with it? Not only that, but somehow this woman is, com- is, is convincing people to commit sexual sin. Now, my mind is completely going, I don't know how this comes about. I don't know how people who have these things describing them, love, faith, service, patience, endurance, how do people with these values inside of them end up getting seduced by a woman who's like a Jezebel to commit both sexual sin and to eat food that's been offered to idols? The Bible never tells us how she does it, but somehow this is what she does. And then God says, believe it or not, God says, I've given her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. And so he goes on to describe what he will do to her in verses 21, 22, and 23. So my next question is, I want to clear something up for you. And some of you might know, but I just want to to give you a little bit of backdrop. Who is Jezebel? Who is she? Well, the truth of the matter is, <coughs> she was the daughter of Ahithabal, the first of Tyre. And she was given to, the, to Ahab, who was the king of the northern, one of the kings of the northern ten tribes of Israel. King Ahab got her as a political... Uh, It's not a concession. There was an alliance made between the king of Tyre and Ahab. And part of the the gifting exchange, because that was what was common. When an alliance was made, gifts were exchanged. And kings often exchanged their daughters. And so she became part of the exchange in, in this whole deal. 
and she, she, she becomes Ahab's wife. And this is all in the book of 1 Kings. According to the biblical narrative, Jezebel, along with her husband, instituted the worship of Baal and Asherah on a national scale. And just so that you know the history and the background of who Baal is, Baal was a weather god in, 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 the, in the Far East with a particular power over lightning, wind, rain, and fertility. I'm going to guess that you don't know what his name became in the New Testament. Beelzebub. Baal became morphed into the New Testament as the word Beelzebub. And Beelzebub is the Lord of flies or the Lord of the dung heap. Or as it became to be known in the New Testament, it was another way of talking about who Satan was. Satan was Beelzebub. So what we get this picture of is this, and, and, and what we need to think of when it comes to these idols, that you sometimes scratch your head and go, how did the children of Israel find themselves worshiping these idols? Because eventually what happens in this whole thing with Baal, she gets the children of Israel, Jezebel does, she seduces Israel into, in the northern tribes to following Baal and Asherah, which was the female god. But, they, but, she, but Jezebel convinced them to follow so many people in Israel to follow uh, Baal that eventually God gets sick and tired of it and gets a hold of Elijah and says to Elijah, I need you to go do this. And we're all familiar with what goes on on Mount Carmel, correct? I can give you the details of that quickly. Eventually, Elijah says to, to Jezebel, in essence, send your prophets. It's been, it, there's, been a, there's been a famine in the, in the land for three years. Elijah came and said to Ahab, it will not rain for three years. Because of this adultery that you guys have been committing and in, in, in worshiping Baal, there will be no rain for three years. And so at the end of this time, God says to Elijah, call the prophets of Baal up to Mount Carmel. I want you to come up there. So they all meet in this huge showdown. Who's God? Who really is God? And Elijah says, okay, we're going to find out today who God is. So he says to the, to the prophets of Baal, set up an altar and, and, you know, put a sacrifice on the altar. And then I want you to call to, to Baal. And I want you to call for, for Baal to call down fire from heaven and to lick up the sacrifice. And it says the prophet of Baal's, the prophets of Baal went at it so, so furiously and they end up cutting their wrists and they're, all, they're actually going crazy. <coughs> and nothing, nothing happens. And then eventually Elijah builds an altar, kills the sacrifice and puts it on top of the, of the altar. And then not, to, not, not only that, but then he says, get me three clay jars, fairly large clay jars, and he pours water on top of the sacrifice. By the way, can you imagine everybody's parched lips as he's dumping out the, the water on this sacrifice? There hasn't rained for three years. And he's wasting three, three huge things of water on this. And then Elijah simply holds his hands up to heaven and says, Oh God, you're the God of, of the universe and of the world. Demonstrate yourself as real right now. Fire fell down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice and the altar that it was on. And then Elijah says this. He turned and looked at everyone and he says, I want you to take the prophets of Baal and slaughter them. And they killed them all. And that was the showdown on Mount Carmel. And, and Jezebel got so upset about it that she said later on, I'm going to make a promise to you. If Elijah's life is still around within a certain period of time, if he doesn't die the way all the prophets of Baal died, then who knows what's going to happen. And so Elijah got scared. This man who called down fire from heaven who looked at the people and said, let's find out who God really is. This Jezebel is the one who enticed them to follow Baal. And so when, when the, the writer of Revelation, John, pulls back and reaches back, and God looks and says, this woman at Thyatira is a Jezebel. She's seducing my people. It was a big deal. And God looked and said, even though you have this love, this faith, 
this patience, this endurance. Even though you have all these things, I am disappointed in you because you have let this woman seduce you. How does a church let that happen? I have no idea. Jezebel was a reckless, determined, arrogant individual who seduced and lured Israel away from God. It is Satan's oldest strategy. I mean, look at Eve in Genesis chapter 3. So let's turn there right now. Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. I'm moving a little bit ahead. So let's go ahead and go there, Lexi. Because this, this enticement is the oldest trick in the book as far as Satan is concerned. So look up here if you don't have it in your Bible. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God, notice, notice how he phrases this. Remember last week I said a half-truth? This is a half-truth. And this is how he gets her. He says, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees of the garden? There's the half-truth. Because God did tell them that there was one tree that they couldn't eat from. He says, from any of the trees in the garden. And so here's her response. Of course, she says, we may eat from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, and now here's where it gets a little different. You must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. That last part of that phrase, or even touch it, That's not in what God told Adam at all. The only thing that God said to Adam is the day you eat from the tree, you will die. And so they're both mixing up their story about what's really going on. Seduction is all about half-truths. You could, or, or you could say the truth but only it can only apply to part of what's going on. Or you could only tell half of what was said. This is part of the problem that's going on in Thyatira. There is this seduction. Here we are again. How does a God-fearing family get entrapped, misled, enticed to follow something so blatantly destructive as sexual immorality or eating food sacrificed to idols. How did did they get tricked? How did the leadership, and now I want to speak to the leaders in in the church right now. How did the leadership permit this behavior of this woman, this individual, to become an acceptable thing in their family? You shake your head how the elders of this church allowed this to happen. Why someone didn't step forward and say, I'm sorry, that may be what you think. This is not what God wants. We will not do this. And and, and as a matter of fact, if she persists in it, then the responsibility they have is to ask her to leave. The question is, how did the leaders let it happen? And we don't know. And, And then on top of that, Jesus not only probably looks at the leaders, but he impugns the entire congregation. The leaders are responsible, but the congregation is painted with the action. He says, this I have against you, it says. No matter how difficult it was to live in Thyatira or anywhere at at that time or or any other place for that matter, God expects us to listen to him and follow him no matter what the reaction or repercussions might be to any of us or for any of us. God is more concerned with the eternity than he is with the present. And that is a difficult concept for us. 
while our actions and decisions in this life have eternal ramifications, it is eternity that matters to God. And the reason why I put this in the sermon is because when we talk about the struggles that we have in our Christian life, when we talk about the, the, the actual realistic difficulties that we face as human beings on a day-to-day -day basis in our walk with God, it happens because although we are caught in a day-to-day -day life, God is ultimately concerned about eternity. And so people will say, well, why would a loving God let people suffer so much in this life? And it's because God is more concerned about eternity than he is about this. I'm not saying God's not concerned about our present day lives and that our suffering doesn't make any difference or it's inconsequential to God. But in the scheme of everything, I'm sure God wants to look at us and say, I know it right now it's hard. I know you're suffering. I know you're under a lot of pain and trial right now, whether it's physical, mental, psychological. I'm sure God looks at us and says, I know it's hard. It's hard getting old. It's hard losing loved ones. It's hard losing children. It's hard wrestling with cancer to get up one day and have to live the next and to, and to find your life shriveling away and eventually finding yourself in so much pain that you have to be on morphine just to live out the last days of your life. I'm sure God looks at us and goes, I know, I understand, it's hard, but hang on. Eternity's coming. And you'll live, I'm sure what God wants to say to us is, you'll live so much longer in eternity than you ever will live in this life. Get a perspective, if you could please. When I've asked you to do this, and I know it's hard, get this into perspective. It will only be for a little while. And if you prove yourself faithful, I will reward you for an eternity. God is so much more concerned about eternity than he is about the present life. And I'm not saying he's not concerned about it. But when God asks a people to, to have patience and endurance, to endure difficulty when, from, from a culture, from people, from torturing, from all kinds of horrible things, that's what it is. And so God is looking at this church and saying, I, it may be hard, but I need, you to, I need you to hold on. Don't give in to this woman. Don't give in to these ideas of, of, of sexual gratification and eating things that you shouldn't eat. How does a person get coaxed away, lured away, and persuaded from a walk down a path that leads to heartache, hurt, and brokenness? Well, James tells us, so let's turn to James chapter 1. And I'm, this is not on the slide, so you're going to need to turn to James chapter 1. The question becomes, how do we get tempted and lured? How does it happen? My goodness, we love God. We come together. We share our lives together. How could any of us get lured into any kind of temptation to make a mistake and fall away? And here's what it is. Let's look in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember this, he says, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone. And here it is, verse 14. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. It is our own desires which pull us and drag us away. It's not God. It's not our culture. It's not somebody else. It is our own internal being our wants, our hungers. I told you before last week that even though we've come to Christ, our flesh is not dead. Our flesh will be pulling at us and calling to us for our entire lives. And just when we think 
that we've overcome it, look out. Because it comes along. If you don't think that this is possible, look with me now at Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. This is the story of God with Cain. And Cain has gotten upset because God did not accept his offering. And the question becomes, well, why did God reject Cain's offering? Cain brought the best that he had of the produce that he had. It wasn't like he brought him rotten fruit or vegetables. And the problem is, is because God has made it clear to them what's supposed to be the sacrifice. It's not fruits and vegetables. It's a living being, an animal. And, and Cain, for some reason, has decided not to bring that. And so the Bible says that God accepted Abel's offering and rejected Cain's. So Cain gets upset, and God comes to him and says this, Why are you so angry? Why do you look so dejected? And then this is what happens. This is what God says to him. You will be accepted if you do what's right, but... If you refuse, if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. That's how we get seduced. We stop being the master over our desires. And what happened in this church, and somehow, in some way, these people got seduced. We're going to pick up this sermon in part two next week. Somehow, some way, these people, this family, allowed themselves corporately to be pulled away. Just like Jezebel did with Israel, this woman did to the church in Thyatira. Even though they were loving, patient, kind, and enduring so much, somehow she was able to pull them and entice them away. And the question becomes, is, it, is, is enticement really that big of a deal? And I would say it is. Do you know how to spot a counterfeit bill? It's much easier now than it used to be. I have, I have in front of me, there are four simple ways to spot a counterfeit. Number one, and this is the first thing that the Treasury Department teaches uh, the, the, the agents who work with counterfeit money. This is the first thing they say to them. Trust your touch. Feeling a bill can be one of the easiest ways to tell whether the money is real or fake. An authentic note will actually feel slightly rough to the touch. As US, U.S. currency uses a unique printing process that results in slightly raised ink. Is the bill you're holding smooth? It might be a counterfeit. Number two, see it in the light. On denominations of five and higher, a security thread or small ribbon is embedded vertically inside the bill. You can see this thread when holding the bill up to the light. When held under UV light, the thread will glow a different color. No thread? Check the year it was printed. Notes printed prior to 1990 did not contain this security thread. Number three, get moving. Tilting the bill top to bottom or side to side can reveal another unique feature of our currency, shifting color in ink. Several small images on currency denominations of 10 or higher contain ink that can change from copper to green when viewed from different angles. Is your bill one color? Check the year or check the other, the other counterfeits or concerns. Finally, ready for a close-up. Pull out your magnifying glass for this one, it says. Microprinting occurs throughout our paper notes from $5 bills and up. Words like the United States of America or USA appear through small, intricate lines and drawings on the currency. Microprinting messy or missing, you might have a counterfeit in your hands. This is what they say. 
We detect counterfeits with, mar- with our machinery and our staff. The feel of the currency is one of the primary factors our staff uses to determine the authentication, the authenticity of a note. U.S. currency is made of 75% cotton, 25% linen, and when you're handling it every day, you definitely know what it feels like. This is one of the things that I have a friend who told me, as a Treasury Department person, what they do is they hand them loads and loads and loads of fake of, of counterfeit bills. And they, may, they basically have them handle them all day long. Look at them, feel them. And, and, and so by the time they get so familiar with what a real bill feels like, that when they, they, they touch a counterfeit, when they go, that's counterfeit. Getting to know God so well, touching God, if I may say it this way, getting so close to God that you know him is one of the first steps that any of us will take if we want to keep from being seduced because the devil is good at this. The Bible says he comes as an angel of light. And if you or I don't think we can't be seduced by him, We can. And this church was. And we need to be careful so that our church will not fall into this sort of thing. And leaders, it is our responsibility to know the real deal and to care for this church's family and life and guard it.